Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Tess Posner to Microsoft today. Uh, she is the CEO of AI for All, an organization that is trying to increase diversity, inclusion, and reliability of AI systems in the world. And you know, she's she's going to be talking about the wonderful work they are doing in that space. Before joining AI for All, she was managing director of Tech Hire at Opportunity at Work, um, an organization initiative launched out of White House. Um, to increase diversity in the tech economy, so very relevant. And before that, she built and ran Summer School, a nonprofit uh, supporting low-income people to find work in the digital economy. Tessa's work has been featured in Business Insider, um, TechCrunch, and Fast Company, and she's going to be talking about how we can hopefully collaborate together to make AI much more inclusive in the future. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you all, and I'm really so excited to be here today and about both our existing partnership with Microsoft as well as new opportunities to really grow and develop how we work together. Um, so to get started, uh, n none of this is a secret to you, but obviously artificial intelligence is really one of the most important technologies um, of, of today and tomorrow. It's been called the new electricity, the driver of the fourth industrial revolution, and is clearly poised to make incredible economic impact on society, as well as get embedded into our daily lives and many of the things that Microsoft is working on. Um, in terms of the incredible impact, there's also potential for AI to create uh, breakthroughs and moonshots and solve some of the world's most pressing problems. And this um, actually came out of uh, the Future Computed, which is a report coming out by Microsoft uh, earlier this year, talking about some of the ways that AI can impact uh, the water supply issues, agriculture, climate change, biodiversity, and really create potential um, moonshots to solve some of these problems. And so there's tremendous potential with this exciting technology that has been around for a while, but because of new developments, we're obviously in sort of an um, AI exciting moment right now, and it's getting talked about a lot in the media as well. However, um, given that this is such an important technology, there are some key risks to both responsible and ethical development of AI that I know Microsoft is really focused on and has been leading in, in these areas. This includes bias in algorithms and machine learning systems, the diversity and talent crisis in AI, both in terms of industry, but also in research and academia, education, and really the lack of access and knowledge about AI. So I want to talk a little bit more about these issues. Um, the first is around the diversity crisis. And so we, we've heard a lot about the diversity crisis in the tech sector more broadly. In AI as a subfield of computer science, um, it's also uh, pretty extreme, and we call it an actual crisis. So some of the data shows 13% of AI and machine learning companies are run by women, and the numbers are even more uh, problematic and scary, frankly. If you look at research, um, tenure-track engineering faculty, less than really 4% uh, minorities. We also see, and we hear a lot of this working in different communities, talking and trying to expose people to AI and just hearing what are their perceptions, what do they actually know about it. And some of the perceptions that are out there are that it's the Terminator, it's coming to get you, it's the robot apocalypse, it's scary, it's dangerous because it's going to take over and automate all of our jobs and what's going to happen. There's wildly different predictions about how it's going to affect the economy and the workforce. And lastly, that it's exclusive and that you need a PhD to get involved um, and really that it's not for me. This is what we hear from a lot of our students at AI for All. This is not for me. And so this perception really is a problem because it prevents people from getting involved in this exciting field as well as shaping our imaginations about what is possible with the technology. We also see bias creeping up in more and more decisions that are affecting people's lives. Some of you may be familiar with this research um, that came out several years ago about how the software called Compass is being used in the criminal justice system to help judges make sentencing and parole decisions. And this software was studied, uh, 10,000 cases of it 
um, used in Florida were actually looked at and there was bias that showed up um, in these risk score algorithms that were shown to be uh, more favorable towards white um, individuals and, and would have uh, higher uh, risk scores for African Americans, even with lesser criminal background history. So obviously this is incredibly problematic for how these systems are getting embedded and already being used out in the wild and affecting people's lives in such extreme ways. Um, other bias examples, and I'm sure you all are familiar with many more, but this is one that obviously came out of Timnit Gebru's research from Microsoft looking at facial recognition systems and showing wildly different levels of accuracy when you look at subgroups, including gender and race. And obviously these systems are getting embedded into hiring processes, into um, the criminal justice system, into the TSA. And so looking at accuracy and bias is critical as these systems are getting more and more prevalent, prevalent in our daily lives. So this isn't just a problem for, sorry. This isn't just a problem for those individuals <coughs> that are actually um, affected, these subgroups that we're talking about. It's also a problem because these systems are being used. So a recent Gallup poll showed that 85% of Americans use AI every day. This is pretty impressive and it's just going to grow. So, how do we actually address this? There are a lot of things that I'm really excited to learn more about from all of you that Microsoft is leading on, including better systems of how we test, monitor, and audit um, AI systems before and in the wild so we can track and, and take, uh, take actions to actually mitigate some of these, fairness, fairness and ethics standards, transparency and explainability, and I know some of you in the room are actually working on this. And of course, lastly, is diversity and inclusion. And all of these we consider at AI for All to be really critical and important um, to addressing this and mitigating these risks. But we believe that one of the most important things is to actually address diversity and inclusion in AI. So that's why we started AI for All which is a nonprofit organization founded to increase diversity and inclusion in AI development, policy, and research. So not just looking at AI development, but also all of the different parts that this technology will touch, including the education system, government systems, and everyone needing sort of not just AI literacy, um, but to have more diversity in all of these areas that are gonna be shaping such important decisions. So I want to share a little bit about our work. So why do, did we start AI for All? There's a challenge when you're looking at barriers to underrepresented populations actually getting into the AI field and touching um, the different ways that this technology will impact all these different areas in, in an interdisciplinary perspective. So in terms of the current homogenous culture in AI, as well as some of the perception issues that we talked about earlier, that doesn't necessarily attract new people getting into the field and can be a barrier. There's also a lack of exposure to technical concepts and certainly AI. So AI is currently not taught in high schools and it's not part of the computer science education. And in fact, only 40% of high schools um, have computer science education even offered, not to mention that they're not including um, new and emerging technologies like AI. And there's a few relatable role models. So a lot of the reason why we choose different careers and why we want to even um, go into these areas is because of who we meet and get exposure to what they do, why they do it, how they do it. And if we don't see individuals that um, we can relate to, it, it's much harder to picture yourself going into that field. Um, and a lot of these are actually based on a Microsoft research um, study that came out about earlier barriers to getting into the computer science field. And so we actually built AI for All to address each of these barriers and ensure that people from all backgrounds are able to get into the field. Um, there's also this idea of peer community and support that is lacking. So if, if you know, that is not 
uh, prevalent at your high school, for example, it can be much more challenging to feel like you can go into, um, you know, a computer science club, for example, that's 100% male if you're a young woman. And that's what we hear from a lot of our students as well. So we address this with co uh, three core initiatives that are really trying to um, not only bring more people into the field to begin with, but also to support their pathway and long-term success. So our first initiative is a summer camp program that exposes diverse high school students to artificial intelligence. And we partner with some of the top research organizations, um, including Stanford University, Princeton, UC Berkeley. And we actually bring students into these research labs over the summer for a two to three week camp. And they learn directly from AI faculty, researchers, um, get technical exposure to AI, get connected with role models and mentors, and then also get to work on AI projects. The second piece is increasing awareness and access to AI, and this is really getting back to the perception issues that we talked about earlier, that AI literacy is really becoming something that needs to be basic for almost everyone participating in our society in the future. And then lastly, research. So I want to talk a little bit more about each of these pieces. The first is our summer camp programs, which I talked a little bit about before. and so. Uh, we Last year, we had summer camps operating at Stanford and UC Berkeley, and this summer we're tripling the number of schools that we're at. And as you can see, each of these schools um, focuses on a slightly different population uh, as well as a uh, different geographical focus. I wanted to share with each of you a little bit more about the curriculum that we've developed in partnership with these universities as well as our uh, team. So the first piece, is technical exposure. Our camps are pretty rigorous because we want to give students that hands-on exposure to some of the key concepts. And importantly, ethics and the societal implications of AI are really a lens that is throughout all of the pieces that we um, share with students. Even the technical concepts, we're always talking about what kind of bias could potentially creep up here, what are some of the mitigation strategies, and what are the implications that this will have, both positive and negative, in the world? And what are some of the frameworks that you can, that are getting developed? <laughs> Although there's not like a consistent framework out there now, we are exposing our students to some of these frameworks um, getting developed. We're also giving them the opportunity to get involved. So on Monday, we're going to be launching the first ever high school committee, committee with the IEEE. AI and Ethics of Autonomous Systems initiative. And so young people are actually going to get a chance to be involved in this conversation and shaping what some of these standards are and getting their perspectives in the mix. Since this generation is really going to be the one that is most impacted by the decisions that we make today, it's critical that we involve them at these early stages. So the second is soft skills and career exploration. And so again, this is going back to the need for role models and mentors. And so we bring in individuals from our industry partners and all different parts of AI to really understand what kinds of careers are out there, what does it actually look like day to day, and also developing that peer and mentorship community that's so important for students. The last piece, which is really exciting and I think we've found has been one of the most successful ways at engaging diverse groups of young people in AI, is to actually create AI for good projects. So not only are students getting hands-on exposure to practice some of the skills that they've developed earlier on, um, but they also are seeing what are the exciting applications of this technology for good and to solve some of the big challenges in the world today. Um, we've seen that this has not only captured our students' imaginations, but that they've gone on to work on AI projects afterwards, start AI clubs at their schools, and even win awards. So just clarification. Yes. Sir. For these summer camps that is happening at, in these universities, um, how does the structure <coughs> look like? Like, do some of them focus on research, some of them are more on the curriculum for learning about these topics, or it's, it's a mix? or it varies from university to university? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
We, our summer camp is structured in a way that we have a core curriculum that focuses on those technical concepts that we mentioned, and each <coughs> camp um, sticks to that and tries to keep that consistent across. And then we have obviously those in-person activities that might vary in terms of which individuals can, are on the career panels and all of that. And each university is responsible for developing AI research projects in partnership with us, but that really is based on some of the research being done in, that, in those labs, as well as what the faculty and PhD students are really passionate about. So it's very much um, you know, taking advantage and leveraging the assets that are at those universities for the research projects. How long does each camp, I'm sorry you may have said this one. Oh, no problem. They're two to three weeks long, um, depending on each site. And they're pretty intensive, so it's, it's all day. <laughs> and then they do fun activities at night. So one of the things that we learned um, this past year in expanding and tripling the number of camps is that there's incredibly high demand for these types of skills. So one of our program that on, programs that only has 20 slots got 900 applications. And so we were like, wow, this is amazing. We also get a lot of interest from all over the world. And how do we embed AI curriculum into what we're already doing, places in every continent, basically? So we decided that we want to open source our curriculum and really try to scale the learnings that we've had and make this available um, worldwide. And we see that there's tremendous um, scale potential here. This is very early stage, and we look forward to launching it later this year. The third piece of what we do that's very exciting is taking graduates from those first two programs and connecting them with mentors to work on more um, rigorous and longer term AI projects. Obviously having portfolios and actual demonstrated work product is so critical in both your education and your career these days. So we're really trying to develop students' portfolios. Um, so we just finished a cohort um, two weeks ago, and we had students working with mentors from IBM, from Pandora, from OpenAI, working on research projects, and here are some of them. So using AI to detect wildfires, um, ranking the urgency of ambulance calls, and personalize this student on the right, working with a mentor from OpenAI, built a math tutor that is adaptive and personalized <coughs> um, that she's planning to actually launch. So we see incredible um, results when we pair our young people with their passions and connect them to that support and that mentorship. Me. Oh, yes, so please. So wondering um, for the mentorship program, um, what is the level of the students? Are they undergraduates or graduate students, high school students? High school students, high yes. School students. Yes, so they're all 10th <coughs> through 12th graders. So we talked a little bit about AI for All's work and why we think diversity is so critical in mitigating the negative impacts like bias and the other ethical risks in artificial intelligence. But really, diversity is critical also for maximizing the potential for AI breakthroughs and moonshots. And so if we increase diversity in AI at these early stages especially, we're going to see more innovative products, a more diverse <coughs> set of problems actually addressed as well as the network effect of bringing more people into the field. And I want to share several case studies that showcase this. So we know that diversity is just generally good for business. A recent Intel report showed that if we increase diversity in the tech economy, it could add $500 billion um, to national GDP. So it's, it's a good business proposition. Additionally, we'll see greater innovation from increasing diversity. So recent um, study from Raj Chetty showed that if we increase uh, early exposure to innovation, the innovation economy, to women, minorities, and low-income students, the rate of innovation in America would quadruple. This is no small thing. And so it's really important to have that early exposure so that we can maximize innovation. Um, in our economy. The second thing is we might miss out on untapped talent that might develop the next big thing in AI or otherwise. And I'll share the example of Amy. So Amy graduated from our um, Stanford AI for All program in 2015, and she was so passionate about 
AI. She'd never been exposed to it before, but she kept on with her research. And how many of you have heard of the NIPS conference? Okay, everyone. <laughs> um, so Amy won Best Paper Award, going up against hundreds of adults um, for her research on improving surgeon technique um, using machine learning. This is pretty amazing for a student that's still in high school. And so we don't want to miss out on talent like Amy that might develop the next big thing. And if Amy had never heard of AI or never been exposed to it, she never would have had that opportunity. We also see that if we increase inclusion and diversity, a more uh, diverse set of problems, more creative set of problems will actually be addressed. So I want to share the story of Stephanie. <coughs> So Stephanie is from Salinas, California. Not sure if any of you are familiar with Salinas. Um, but it is uh, an area where she actually grew up as a daughter of farm workers in a very low income family, first generation Mexican American. And she graduated from our program. And not only did she start an AI club at her high school, which is pretty impressive, and she's uh, teaching younger students about AI, She's doing research to track the flow of contaminated water using machine learning with her mentor from Accenture. And this is something that she's still in the early stages of, but she wants to bring this back to her community because it's something that's faced her um, both personally and directly. So here's Becca. Um, so Becca went through our AI for All program, and she was really uh, torn between sort of her, her passion for social justice and humanitarian work. But through exposing her to all the different ways that AI can be a applied for good and to benefit humanity, she became really, really passionate about combining those two pieces together. So I'll just share her quote. Seeing the humanitarian applications in AI at Stanford AI for All, I realized that I didn't have to sacrifice fundamental aspects of my identity to pursue computer science. I love computer science, and I see it as a tool to utilize in art, music, and political advocacy. STEM can be really powerful when applied to other fields. So we see that if we increase diversity, we're not only going to get more creative uses of AI, um, discover untapped talent that we wouldn't have found before, but also new interdisciplinary ways to apply AI to different fields and really tap into people's unique passion and interests. We also see that when we increase diversity and inclusion, it really has this network effect that we've seen that's been really, really powerful. So most of our students leave AI for All programs uh, wanting to pursue AI and feeling like they're part of this incredible community. And what that's led to is that they go on to educate their peers as well as their community. And we track this. So for every one student that we educate, they go on to educate 11 more. And so when you bring more people into the field, it has this incredible multiplier effect. They bring their friends, they bring their friends, and just a small investment in one person can be really powerful in making an impact there. We also see the same thing with organizations and companies. Um, I think Microsoft is certainly a great example of this, where when one company steps up and invests in you know, really uh, this principled approach to AI development and really looking at um, bias and mitigating that at these early stages as well as investing in the next generation of talent, it then brings other leaders into the field and it shows the way and it influences other companies. Um, so these are a lot of our AI for all partners that we currently work with and the list is growing. And so I think it's really important um, not just to have inclusion and diversity bringing in um, individuals into the field, but also in showing other companies and organizations and institutions that really need to step up and be leaders in this way and bring their, their colleagues and peers along. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how you all can get involved with us. So we currently are really excited about our partnership with Microsoft, and there's a couple of um, specific ways that um, I've set out here that we'd love to continue deepening this work that we're doing together. But I also want to hear from you all if there are other things. Um, the first is recruiting. So we are obviously graduating an amazing set of 
um, the next generation of AI leaders. And so if you have internships, if you have an apprenticeship program, if you're hiring, um, consider AI for All a source of, of talent for, for these roles. Secondly, we have um, many, many volunteering opportunities for folks to serve as mentors for this next generation of talent. Um, a mentor can absolutely change someone's life and change some, someone's trajectory. And we have both one-day opportunities as well as these longer-term opportunities to support students on an actual research project. And share feedback. Again, that's such an important part. We consider this a dialogue and a two-way street that we want to learn what are you all finding in the best practices for mitigating bias? What are some of the challenges and nuances that you're seeing in your work? And how can we leverage those learnings to prepare the next generation to do this well and to make the right decisions? So we want to hear from you and, and work closely on that. Um, I know you all also do a lot of outreach and education yourselves, and some of you in the room are doing that. And I want to hear more what's working, how can we partner and, and collaborate on those efforts. This problem is obviously not something that one organization or one company can solve, so it's really important for us to come together and really solve this together. Um, so with that, and if you are interested in volunteering, I have a link right here that makes it really easy to sign up and you can let us know if you're interested and in what capacity and also our contact information. But I'd love to hear from the room if you have questions either about our work um, or ideas for ways that we can work together to both support the next generation of diverse AI leaders, but also ensure a responsible and ethical use and deployment of this important technology. So any questions, thoughts, feedback? Yes. And I apologize, I was a few minutes late coming from another meeting. No problem. The graphic show that sort of number of students touch, which is extremely impressive. How are you getting that um, that volume of touch when you say you have programs that sort of only accept 20 students? Yeah, that's a great so question. Where does that number come from? Yeah, so um, right now our main programs are at these universities that have you know between 20 and 30 slots. And I think what you're referring to is our open sourcing project that we've, is really our scaling plan. So we're getting so much demand and so much interest and we believe that this access to AI tools, education and resources should be widely accessible. And that's not getting addressed right now, um, at least in the US at the K through 12 level. So we're taking the, the curriculum and learnings that we've built for our summer camps and open sourcing them to make them more widely available, which we have the goal of reaching millions through that model um, by working with existing partners, schools, and, and companies who are already in the, doing this work. Thank you, good question. So in your summer camp curriculum, what are the kinds of applications you have the kids working on? Yeah. So um, we focus on robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, um, and each of the universities develops a set of projects that are focused on those applications but are all around AI for good. So for example, looking at social media data and analyzing that after a natural disaster. Um, we were looking at uh, after Hurricane Sandy data set to see how would you better funnel resources towards that in, in response to sort of lessen response times and make them more accurate. Um, or making hospitals safer using computer vision. Or how does the self-driving car revolution affect mobility for aging populations? Um, so, so those are some of them and we have about four to five projects at each of our universities that are co-designed with those researchers and faculty. Great question. Yeah, I love that because I, when I look at most curricula, especially for kids, you see sort of the same things come up again and again, like robots. And for like a, a kid like, like one of the ones you showed who's really interested in social justice, that's just not going to be a turn off. So I love the, the approach you're taking. Thank you. Yes. What about data sets um, for these? Is it that um, program has, has data sets that all the different universities use, or are the researchers at the different institutions providing the data sets? Um, yeah, great question. 
It's a combination. Obviously, getting good data sets is one of the key challenges, right? And so that's part of what we try to teach our students is how do you find the right data set? How do you analyze the data set so you know it's quality? What is, does size matter? Where do you host it? All of that. And so that's why we certainly provide some of them, but we also allow the students to try to go out and identify where can you find this kind of open source. Um, we've also leveraged tools like Kaggle um, and other other kind of open source tools that are out there, and in some cases, the universities will provide those data sets. It's a great question. Yes. Do you also have opportunities for people who are, you know, have already sort of studied a field and sort of looking to move into, the, like, because these are, I think, mostly focused on, uh, you know, students, high school students uh, who are interested in getting into it, and they haven't had, you know, education shaped in a particular way, but do you also have opportunities for people switching fields? That's a great question. So currently we don't, so our summer camps are mainly for high schoolers, but our open source curriculum will be available and open for anyone to use because obviously there, there is a gap in basic AI training at all levels. Um, so it's a good question. Other questions? Yes. I think there is a difference between creating like an edX or Coursera course and the approach of summer schools. So, you know, I feel like the impact you're having, you cannot really access it if these students are sitting at home and just watching the material in an online way. So there, there seems like there's a human touch part and meeting with people and working with them and getting their hands dirty. So in terms of scaling it, um, open sourcing the content is one part of it, but I guess you still need partners in different parts of the country and even the world that are going to physically host these camps and be the mentors. So I'm kind of trying to understand how much of it is going to be the open source content that scales and how much of it is still going to be like the organizational and hands-on and one-to-one -one mentoring kind of style. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a good question and we find obviously a lot of the barriers for people that are currently excluded from these fields have to do with lack of role models and mentors and those pieces and we don't want to miss that in, in these new models. So in terms of our open sourcing curriculum, it's not going to be just a MOOC. So there will be some materials that will be openly available, but then we also are working with partners closely who are already teaching, let's say, CS classes um, or run, you know, after school STEM programs. Um, that can actually provide that in-person component. So absolutely, we don't want to miss out on that because the peer community, that human touch, as you said, is really a critical part of why our programs have been successful. Um, we also will be offering, again, that mentorship, fellowship opportunity to students that want to continue their learning. We also see that with the open source piece, that will really give people exposure to what is available in this field, and then they can take that knowledge further. So we'll be really, really, I think there's a big gap right now in terms of what is even a career in AI. So the work that you all do is absolutely so interesting. <laughs> and if, if more people could understand, like, what are the different pathways? What are the things that you can work on? Um, I think that will inspire a lot of people to pursue this. And so we're also going to have sort of like a career exploration component and element where s people know hey, if I'm really interested in research and what does that actually look like, I can go in this pathway in this direction. Um, so I think that we'll give them specific steps of how to move on to that, that next phase of their learning. Good question. Other thoughts? So I think uh, in terms of understanding um, a career in AI, uh, it seems like the program covers the education part and then the research part of his partners, but it seems to me like there is a gap, like the industrial part is missing here, because AI is now very, is more like a common practice, or it will become more common in, in the industry part, in the engineering um, segment, as well as like data scientist, data analyst. It seems this part is sort of missing in this program, so is there a specific reason why you focus, choose to focus on, on research instead of the engineering part? That's a great question. So I think that's where our industry partners come in and are so critical to this. So we're actually 
working with a lot of different um, AI-focused companies that can offer our students both internship opportunities, um, job shadow opportunities, mentor opportunities to really get exposure to what these different careers are, not just in research. Um, we, we focus on research in the class itself because that's a fun and hands-on way for students to get exposure to some of the applications. Um, we also do cover some Python coding, um, but they're also, when you look at the computer science education world, there are actually a lot of organizations that are doing really amazing work in teaching coding and engineering and computer science. And so we're not trying to duplicate that. We're actually trying to be complementary. So if somebody wants to continue and deepen their Python skills, we provide them with resources, but we're really not a coding program. Um, and so both we're trying to provide that exposure to industry through our partners and connecting students. So at each camp, we'll have many guest speakers from industry talking about their work, their applications, and we have career roundtables and mentorship opportunities. So they are still getting that exposure to the different sides of it. And we're not trying to say you should go into one or the other. It's, it's not really a directive experience. It's really like, here are the broad opportunities and you need to select which path is right for you. And here's what you need to be successful in that path and we'll support you. But we're certainly agnostic in terms of what the opportunities actually are. Great question. Yes. Uh, this is really amazing work. Thank you for sharing it with us. I have a question about the innovation beyond the education piece, the innovation that's coming out of the projects that some of these students are doing. What mechanisms do you have in place to nurture and sustain or provide some sort of path forward? Uh, the example that you gave with the water, contaminated water flow. So how, what, what formal mechanisms have you put in place to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're actually expanding out our alumni program right now with that exact goal in mind. Um, we found that students, I think it was pleasantly surprising to us that a lot of students wanted to continue that research already in high school. And so we are putting more formal mechanics, mechanisms into place as well as keeping that community element going. So we have ongoing educational opportunities. Um, we are now starting to place students at internships as they're sort of graduating high school and into college, as well as providing opportunities to continue their research. And so that's really the purpose of the, the fellowship and then, again, the relationship with the industry and academic partners. Great question. It's really, really important because obviously we want them to be able to take these solutions further and out into the world. Other questions? Yes. This won't be a very um, pithy question, but um, AI is such a broad technology and we're expecting it to have such broad impact, right, on every industry and lots of different aspects of life. Um, but so much of the discussion is still starts from a technical perspective rather than um, a different perspective, like a social science perspective or a um, agricultural perspective, right? Um, and the solutions that are needed within those communities and how technology can help or better thought of are, are more likely to be productive if they start there rather than starting from technology. <coughs> and I notice that younger people getting into the field tend to have a more natural affinity towards thinking about things more broadly, but I'm wondering about programs like this, especially with the youngest people who are getting in, um, how can they be encouraged to think about it uh, from, un from multiple perspectives or from a very specific perspective that they're super into, but it doesn't necessarily start with the technology. I think that's exactly what we see, is that the application first approach is what is most effective at engaging young people into the field. And we actually don't consider you know, just technical AI jobs as the goal. It's really about an interdisciplinary approach, which we know is, is needed in terms of how this technology is going to impact all these different industries, all these different areas. So I'll give you one example. Our Princeton program is more focused on AI policy. And they're actually taking a field trip to Washington, DC, um, and connecting with key leaders who are thinking about that on a broad level. And even though it still has that technical rigor, because that technical exposure is important in understanding that in a deep way, um, not just glazing over it, um, is really critical. But we want to make sure that students are getting exposed to, you know, how is this going to affect 
the criminal justice system? How is this going to affect social services? Get embedded in healthcare? You know, all these different areas. Um, and so I think that's both in reflected in how we actually teach it, starting with the application and then moving into the technical side, as well as the kind of projects and other exposure that our students are getting. Thank you. That's a great question and really critical, I think. Yes. So I, I have a multi-part question, but I think I'll, I'll just start with the easy one. Uh, how much does the summer camp cost? Yeah, great question. Yeah. So um, most of the camps are free or very low cost for the students, so access is absolutely critical. And we have full scholarships available for those that can't pay, um, even if there is a fee. Awesome. And then do you do like name scholarships? Like let's say uh, a company gives a chunk of money to your organization, does that then end up in like branded scholarships for students or how uh, is there, what, what kind of play is there to integrate industry partnership donations with your organization? That's a great question. We haven't done that yet. Um, I think we'd be open to it for sure. I mean, access is, is absolutely critical in providing this education for students that need it most. Um, we currently work with funders that kind of more support general operations or that haven't specifically done like a scholarship fund per se. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely open to those discussions. Cool. Well, yeah, it seems like there's such an opportunity because I, I recently heard a statistic that it's cost like up to 5x to recruit a diverse employee, right? Like it, there's an extreme cost to doing this um, at scale, but it seems like you're also, you're cultivating a, such top talent with, with this field that it makes sense for an industry partner to potentially like, you know, give something for a specific scholarship or, or a specific opportunity. So I, I just think there's like a, a huge philanthropies play. I don't know, is, is that part of your docket today to talk to philanthropies a little bit or uh, has that conversation started? Yeah, and Microsoft is already a financial supporter of AI for All, so that's great and we'd love to, to talk about increasing that for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Other questions? How are we doing on time? Well, we, we have another 40, 45 minutes. If oh, we wow. Want to, well, <laughs> you can also keep it shorter and so that people can um, spend the time in different ways. But my, so first of all, we just started this partnership and on the MSR side, the outreach team um, is in contact with TAS about planning and deciding next steps. But I think we can do a lot together and if you have feedback for the outreach team, you know, this is one of the things they are they are thinking about. Either we can talk to test directly <coughs> or plan internally with the outreach team. Those are all I think possibilities and that's one of the reasons why TESS is here today to start that connection. My question is um, for a program where there are like nine hundred applicants and twenty spots, what is the current selection criteria like? Yeah. So we have an application process that is mostly um, qualitative. So we ask key questions like about leadership, their interest in AI. They don't have to have any coding experience or AI experience. Um, this is specifically trying to track students that are not coming in with that. Um, so it, it's a set of essay questions mostly, kind of like maybe you'd see in a college application process. Um, we do look at math and what math background they've, they have because if they're not at a certain level, it, it will be more challenging to get through some of the more technical pieces of the course. But most young people that are at a ninth grade math level and above um, are, are good. And then, um, yeah, I think w in terms of where we recruit from, just to, to add on to that, we actually found that doing direct outreach within high schools and working with teachers directly is the most effective um, because there isn't a lot of knowledge out there about what AI is, what those terms even mean, and there's a lot of misperceptions about what it is. There's a lot of fear out there. Making that human connection with students and sharing what is this really and what are the opportunities and you know what kinds of jobs can you get in this area has been really successful at bringing in students that wouldn't otherwise get exposure to this? Great question. Anything else? Yes. And, and I don't know if who, who would speak to this, but do you have an ambition for um, a role that MSR might be able to play in this other than, um, you said a lot of your industry partners um, provide internships and things like that, but um, 
it went by quickly, but the universities that are involved, none of them are sort of in this area. Um, is there thoughts of running camps in the Seattle area, or what type of um, involvement do you guys think we're I aiming for? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, so we're definitely interested in expanding the summer camps. I think given this group and the focus here, research is um, a really exciting area. So we do have this fellowship program that does focus on connecting researchers in the field with our students and helping us design the right researchers. Um, there's also opportunities for, I think, thought leader shared thought leadership around what ethics frameworks should we be including in our curriculum and how can you all advise on that based on what's actually happening in this space um, i think there's some education opportunities that we're going to be talking about later as well in terms of how do we collaborate on outreach or education initi initiatives that you all are already doing and sharing cross learnings um, <clears throat> we're also in contact with the teals program um, and so actually we connected with them to recruit for this year for the summer camps and so how do we kind of tighten tighten that partnership even more um, and so those are those are some of the the key areas I think there's expansion you know the technical content research um, mentorship and and taking advantage of all the amazing talent here and connecting that with the next generation um, and then of course us being a potential source of talent for you all as these young people go into the field. But we are certainly open to other ideas. I think, again, these conversations are just at the early stages, and we're excited to build a deep and long-term relationship. So I'd be eager to get folks' feedback as well. It would be great to go beyond start too. And I know we're yeah. sponsoring it now, but Microsoft is a much bigger place than we are, and I think that's probably really critical for the longer term. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if you've thought about um, also uh, um, doing some uh, young participants back to industry feedback, right? Um, mm. It is, it's not just that we need to recruit people who look different than our current <coughs> population does, it's that we need to understand how it needs to be different in order for that to be a healthy thing to happen. Mm -hmm. I also think that um, these young people, like there's, we have a lot of misperceptions about them as we get older and how they think about privacy and how they think about security and how they think about their own personal agency and how they think about technology. And we could learn so much um, by having them talk to us about those things and I think they could feel very, um, very appreciated and empowered by having the opportunity to teach us what they know that we don't. Absolutely, I think that's an amazing idea and it's very kind of reflective of what we're doing like with IEEE that I mentioned earlier where we're actually having the young people give substantial feedback on some of the standards um, and working groups that they're developing. So I think that kind of approach would be amazing and I don't know what format exactly that could take but I think <coughs> you would find if you met any of our students that they're skilled, passionate, energetic, smart enough to offer like really helpful feedback in those ways and that I learn a lot from them certainly and I'm sure everyone else would too. Thank you for that. We have two questions coming online. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, one of them is asking, would love to hear if rural populations are underrepresented. If AI is the new electricity, do we need a TVA or REA to ensure it reaches rural America? That's one of the questions. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Absolutely, we consider rural um, underrepresented and we actually do outreach to make sure that so a lot of our camps are actually residential which means our, our students stay overnight and so it is it can be accessible to folks not just coming from those areas where the schools actually are which at least right now are primarily you know in in cities and so we are AI for all so we absolutely consider those areas that are most at risk of getting left out of this conversation and being part of shaping it um, to be our target focus so and in fact we we're really interested in also expanding um, our camps to other geographies to make the geographical footprint more diverse 
as well as this open source piece um, because access is such a huge, huge issue. I think though one of the challenges, I've worked in rural areas um, in the past and bandwidth and internet connectivity, 50% of low income households in the US don't have access to internet at home which is shocking <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, but even if you go to like a local library, the, the bandwidth may not be good enough to even run a YouTube video. So how do we address that at more of an infrastructure level so that we can really provide access to rural areas that are really left behind in the digital divide? The second question is, we keep hearing about an AI ethical framework and principles. Do you have a draft of those principles? <laughs> what is the roadmap for having a broad agreement on the framework and principles? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are not a framework development organization ourselves. Um, the best that we can do right now is really, uh, really stay connected to the conversations of who is developing those frameworks. So for example, like I mentioned, IEEE, their AI and Autonomous Systems Ethics Initiative, um, it's a long name, has great work being done on creating those standards. And they actually just put out a paper called Ethically Aligned Design that has a set of principles that they put forth that were developed in these working groups um, from very diverse areas. And I definitely recommend taking a look at that. Um, it's, it's, you know, a, a really interesting and in-depth committee and framework. Sorry, what? ACM, the Association. ACM, yes, machine. exactly. Um, uh, there's a group called Partnerships on AI that, ha uh, that Microsoft um, is also involved with that is working on creating working groups to create standards as well. And so I think there's a lot of these initiatives that we're seeing um, happening, and we're not putting forth one of these kind of set of standards, but rather exposing our students to these different initiatives that are going on and what some of the nuances in the discussions are. Um, so I hope that it, that answers the question. Any other questions? I have a broader question, um, which is, you know, last year there was the Google employee, the, the, there was this memo from a Google employee talking about overall women in the field and, you know, how there's positive discrimination and men are actually like, Versa because of that and so forth. You know, being in Silicon Valley and, you know, being in this community, how do you think we are reacting towards these kind of, um, these kind of kind of backlashes or how do we change the culture? I, I'm just curious about your thoughts about all of these discussions that are going on in this space, not so much about high school students, but about the industry that we're in. Yeah, no, it's a really, really, Great question, and I think there's been a lot of attention on it lately, like with the Me Too movement, and certainly that memo that you're referring to. Um, and I think as more and more people speak out, and more and more research is, is also being done in terms of retention in the tech sector and what it actually takes to not just ensure that we're hiring diverse workforce, but ensure that we're retaining them, that they can be successful and advance and move up. Because obviously, as we talked about earlier, that's good for business and good for individual teams. Um, but I think inclusion has emerged as a really important second leg. So at first the conversation was all around diversity and improving your hiring numbers, but this, you also need to retain this talent and so having an inclusive culture is equally important. And I think we see companies investing in mentorship programs, um, having the right policies, there are tools that are cropping up to support that. Um, both in the hiring process, for example, to reduce bias, as well as um, support systems for employees that are currently experiencing harassment or discrimination. I mean, I think ultimately it's, it, whenever there's more honest discussion <coughs> and people are speaking out about these issues and it becomes more, um, more honest and people that have been maybe victims of unfortunate circumstances are able to have a voice, there's always going to be a backlash to that. And I think it's, we need to have the hard conversations, we need to look at the data, and we need to be really, really proactive and, and track all of these metrics and hold ourselves accountable to, to solving these issues. Because it's not just, 
a problem for the individuals, it's a problem for the companies, it's a problem for the teams, and it's, it's everyone's problem. I think that's my own perspective, <laughs> is that it's not just a problem for women to solve, it's a problem that affects everyone, and everyone loses if certain groups are left out. Um, so I, I hope that the conversation continues, I hope that we're able to have the difficult and challenging conversations that might be uncomfortable, and I hope that we can address this. And I think with AI, it's such an exciting moment because while we're seeing a lot of um, challenges and certainly there's a diversity crisis in the field, there's also the opportunity to address it at these early stages and kind of steer the train in a better direction. Um, so I'm very optimistic, or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, <laughs> but I also think we have to be proactive um, in all sorts of ways. It's not just going to take one magic bullet, and it's not just going to take one organization. It's going to take a community and our whole society coming together um, and, and collaborating to solve, solve this challenge. Great question. Okay, so if that's it, let's thank Pass. Thank you. Thank you so much.